Brevard's future as the Space Coast could hinge on a remote 150-acre parcel at the northern tip of Kennedy Space Center, as our headliner explains today. Once a citrus community called Shiloh, private rocket companies such as SpaceX and Blue Origin want to build an all-new, bare-bones launch facility there beyond the Space Center's security and red tape. The Shiloh site would be cheaper and more economical, assuming NASA gives the land to the state of Florida to run. But NASA has said no so far and SpaceX is looking at sites in Texas. For a deeper explanation, we talked today with Dale Ketchum, Director of Strategic Alliances for Space Florida. Ketchum also serves as Director of the University of Central Florida's Spaceport Research and Technology Institute. Also coming up in the program, correspondent Luann Manerville hits to the streets to find out how Brevard residents are coping with the budget cuts under the federal sequester, assuming they noticed any. And public interest curator Alice Garwood takes a look at what Florida Today readers have been telling us in print and online. Now, watch my interview with Dale Ketchum. Dale, it seems like much of the commercial space future for Brevard pivots somewhat on a small piece of land at the very far north end of Kennedy Space Center, kind of on that line between Brevard and Volusia counties by right. the Hallover Canal. What's going on? Well, you. I hadn't heard it characterized that way, but it certainly resonates that it does pivot in large measure um, because as uh, SpaceX is not the only company involved, but clearly, clearly they're the industry leader. They're the company we most are eager to attract first, um, and they are the company most anxious out there to identify and establish a purely commercial spaceport. Okay. And as Elon articulated before the Texas legislature this month, uh, Texas is in the lead. And his characterization was it's very exciting that Texas is likely to be the home of the world's first commercial Cape Canaveral. And that hurt. Well, so why, why, what, why does he want this piece of land? I mean, he's at, you're asking to, well, it's not to, let, to have Kennedy Space Center I guess, give that piece to the state? Yes. What Elon and the rest of the commercial market is looking for, and it's not just because Elon Musk is looking for it or Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin or whomever else, it's that their customers want it, the people who build and provide the, sat the big commercial satellites. They, if you recall, in the 1980s, 100% of the commercial satellite market in the world launched from Florida. We're now down over the last two years to zero. We don't do that anymore. That market voted with its feet and left. It's being launched by the Europeans, the Russians, the Chinese, and now the Brazilians and the Indians are getting in the market. We're attempting to recapture that back um, a as a country through Elon Musk, uh, Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin, Paul Allen with Strato Launcher. There's a number of people getting into the market because they, they believe that they can provide the technology necessary to recapture a big chunk of that world global market. That would be good. Um, it's particularly intriguing because in terms of price to launch, what it costs to put your payload in orbit, uh, Elon being Elon and being different, if you want to know what it costs to put a satellite in orbit, go to his webpage. It's right there. Nobody else does that. Right. And he'll match that. He'll guarantee that price, personally guarantee it. Um, what's interesting is that the prices he's offering to the world, and he's now got oh, 56 launches manifest. I mean, the guy's doing what he says he's going to do. Um, and the, the head of the Chinese Space Agency, uh, within two years, said, we don't know how he does it because we can't beat that price. Now, how many other industries in the United States are there where the Chinese are going, we can't touch that price? <laughs> right. Um, and the goal is he's going to continue to do his um, NASA launches here, his Department of Defense launches here, his government launches will continue to stay here. What he's looking for is a clean sheet of paper, a green field, to establish a purely commercial launch operation that has absolutely nothing more than what is absolutely required because that allows him to offer those cut rate prices. And he can't get that in the middle of the federal reservation, whether it's the Air Force Station or Kennedy Space Center. Because he, as a businessman, 
even if Charlie Bolden and Bob Cabana promised him, there, you know, you can do what you want on this piece of property, we promise never to touch you. He would be a fool to believe that, not because they're disingenuous individuals, but because there'll be other center directors, other NASA administrators, Congress will assign the agencies new missions, and if you're in the middle of their reservation, their job is not to take care of you, it's to get their missions done, even more so with the Air Force. Right. And it, that's the reason the commercial market left before. And they're not coming back to go through that again, especially when they don't have to. What makes the cost of launching from the government site more? more? What makes it more expensive? Is it just the red tape and delays? Is there more equipment than is needed for today's more fleet operations like SpaceX? Well, you could conceivably put an absolute bare bones minimum uh, launch site somewhere at Kennedy Space Center or on one of the abandoned pads. But there's, uh, as an example, there are four major satellite manufacturers. There are more than four, but there are four big ones. Three of them are not American. And as we know here, if you're launching a satellite, people send their people with their payload to hold its hand and take care of it until it launches. If you're not an American, you've got to go through all kinds of security requirements to get on site that you don't have to if you're in Texas or Georgia or Puerto okay. Rico. We're trying to provide them with what they can get elsewhere because what they can get elsewhere can't be delivered at Kennedy Space Center. Or Ease Kaepernick. of access, and, and guaranteed and access if there's a terrorist attack or absolutely. something like that. And, and the, the market knows that. The We're dealing with a commercial market. Those satellites generate so much money that the difference between having to wait a week and not wait a week can be millions and millions of dollars. And from the perspective of the marketplace, NASA may have good reasons why there's a problem, the Air Force may have its reasons, they, make, they can talk about how they're mitigating them, and they are working their tail off to try to mitigate them. But at the end of the day, the market doesn't care, nor should it. It's go where you can get the best price. We'll tackle more topics with Space Florida's Dale Ketchum in just a moment. Now, here's what correspondent Luann Manerville learned when she asked people here in Brevard what they make of the scary budget sequester. Our, our government is about to make some cuts. They already have um, the sequesterization. Um, it could be affecting us here in Brevard County in many ways. Employment, Medicare, what, what, sure what does it mean to you? Well, uh, a lot of my friends no longer work out at the Space Center people that I worked with out there, and uh, that's hurt us tremendously, especially in the Titusville area. Uh, our schools are hurting here. Apparently, state governments picked up some of the, uh, the things that the federal government no longer pays. Uh, yeah, it hurts. I'm not on Social Security, so that part doesn't hurt me, but my dad is, and if that gets cut back, he'll be hurt there. Um, are, do you have some concerns about um you know, maybe your parents um, losing some of their Medicare, things like that. Is that a concern for you? Well, they're not quite to that age yet, <laughs> but certainly for my grandparents, I'm worried about that for them. I'm worried about uh, the people that we serve in our local nonprofit community. I'm worried about how it impacts those clients um, in terms of government funding for services. And then obviously, we're standing in front of the library. <laughs> when government funding cuts start to impact our local libraries, then I will really be concerned. I think it might impact the local economy. You know, obviously, everything from, you know, we have the military presence, obviously, with Patrick and everything else, and contractors. I do a lot of contracting work. So I think I might see something on that side of it. I mean, I'm not sure it's going to affect me at all. Um, you know, we live off of a, a military retirement, so we have a fixed income that is, um, I won't say guaranteed, but um, pretty solid. So um, we personally haven't been hit hard by what's been going on in the last four or five years. Uh, we've come to this point because we seem to have Congress that's not quite agreeing at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, what kinds of things would you suggest? What would you do yourself to change things? Um, I would probably hire somebody who's not politically biased to review the, the budget. I mean, there's a lot of things. All you have to do is look at typically how our system works now. I, I mentioned contracting earlier. But if you look at that, I mean, if you even if you don't finish on time, the government pays people a certain amount of money. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that things could be done as far as 
how we manage our money, how we use our money as a whole. I mean, if we, I'm not saying run it as a corporation because I'm not big on that, but we can certainly learn a lot from the private sector in terms of how to be lean. If we apply some of those practices and got out of the whole, like, well, I'm part of this party or I'm part of that party, I'm liberal, I'm conservative, I'm Republican or whatever, even from the Congress, and, oh, I have to take care of my constituents. Yeah, okay, that makes a lot of sense, but we have to kind of look at the country as a whole, I think, and get away from that for a second and say, look, we need to do something. I think Congress is too worried about being reelected, okay? Uh, if they were to, if they were not influenced by the donations that they get, which helps reelect them, then I think, you know, they might vote a little differently. Um, I just, it's, it's all about politics and how to stay in office. It's, it's not about the common man anymore. The government has already pretty much, you know, spelled out everything when they said they were gonna to have to do it. It's a shame, they, this, this kind of stuff's been going on for years. So I don't really think uh, people should really get too upset because you know, it's been going on before the, even the, you know, everything started taking place, you know, before 2007, 2008. So if you haven't got used to the idea, then I'm sorry for all you because it's, you know, we're, you know, it's nothing we can really do about it, really. Thanks, Luann, for that. Here's more of my interview now with Dale Ketchum, Director of Strategic Alliances for Space Florida. What is it about space that seems to be drawing these internet people and, and software developers? Is it because well, they sit in rooms and look at code so often that they want to get outside and launch something well, with fire and smoke, or is it? Uh, hopefully, it's the same thing that you know inspires the youth of America when we have a vibrant challenge in space, whether it's Sputnik or Apollo or shuttle or station. Um, you know, space is something that is naturally um, a fundamental component of any American because we are at our core and like to think of ourselves as explorers. And uh, now we're also doing it with, in nanotechnology, you know, information technology, and there's a lot of neat ways to go. But space is naturally extremely seductive and probably will remain so particularly given the fact that you've got a lot of companies now who are getting into the marketplace. Most of them won't succeed, but we're getting started to look at space as a place to make bazillions of dollars in harvesting asteroids and, and, and other, other neat ways in which to make money in space. And that should be where America really shines. And that's sort of what's motivating these entrepreneurs is to they look at space and they go this is ridiculous the way we do it now mm -hmm. we should be able to get up there quickly and cheaply and reliably so that our investment can be in what we're doing up there instead of just getting there so the initial request by space florida of the kennedy space center or of nasa to give it a piece of that land so that it could give SpaceX and Elon Musk, that blank sheet of paper, mm -hmm. they, re they, de they denied that initially. What's yes. the next step at this point? Well, we remain in, in uh, good conversation. I mean, uh, we're meeting with them weekly. And there's a lot of dialogue going back and forth. The, the fundamental challenge is NASA's trying to come up with a way to meet the need. Right. And we're working with them to get there. but. As it stands right now, any launch off federal property is under the jurisdiction of the Air Force. Hmm. There's also the matter of sheer proximity. Even if it's state land in the middle of Kennedy Space Center, right. you're still in the middle of a federal reservation. There's no way that eventually that's not going to impact your business model. And even if the risk is minimized, it's a risk you don't have in Texas or Georgia or Puerto Rico. The goal for Elon Musk is to make the only federal agency he has to deal with is the FAA, because the FAA is going to be involved regardless of where the launch is, because somebody's going to impose the same safety requirements mm -hmm. regardless of where the launch occurs. If it's here, the safety requirements are imposed by the Air Force. If it's anywhere else, it's the FAA. And he wants to only deal with the FAA. And quite frankly, I don't blame him. 
we're just, I understand what he's trying to do and why. I would want to be doing the same thing. We're just trying to provide a, a template where it would allow him to do what he can, wants to do in Texas, let him do it here. Coming up, we'll talk more with Dale Ketchum of Space Florida. Here's Alice Garwood with a look at your letters to the editor. Several readers recently have shared their views on the sequester. Mark Bergstrom of Vieira writes, there is no real impact to the number of federal employees per the sequester. Sequester only furloughs government employees for a given temporary period of time. Sequester does not in any way, shape, or form reduce the total number of employees of the federal government. This is nothing more than an inside the beltway con game perpetrated on the American people, pure and simple. Betty Yarick of Palm Shores questioned the United States continuing to help other countries in the midst of its own economic woes. She writes, with all the limitations about the sequester and everyone worrying about cuts in salaries, layoffs and furloughs, I was shocked to read recently in Florida today that $250 million in U.S. aid is being released to Egypt. Why are we giving money to other countries when our own people are being asked to sacrifice their jobs and financial security? Len Silver of Melbourne was upset about a recent letter ridiculing another reader's response to federal cuts to Kennedy Space Center. He writes, the individuals who man the Space Center are overwhelmingly hardworking and highly trained and have made great sacrifices to achieve their success, laughing gleefully when any of them are reduced to unemployment status by unwise and short-sighted federal spending cuts is unacceptable. We need to get busy working together to solve the problems that have resulted in huge numbers of Americans being relegated to the unemployment rolls. Ernest Copenhaver of Deltona opposes SpaceX's proposed site for a launch complex at KSC. He writes, SpaceX Corporation has no regard for the environment. They want to build a launch complex at Kennedy Space Center that directly abuts the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, Canaveral National Seashore, and the Mosquito Lagoon. These areas are national treasures, and launching from this site would devastate the environment. I'm Alice Garwood, Public Interest Curator for Florida Today. Remember, we welcome your comments on anything you see on these subjects or read in Florida Today by sending an email to letters at floridatoday.com. Thanks, Alice. In our final segment, I asked Space Florida's Dale Ketchum about the state of the industry and about his agency's effort to lure new research and testing of drones in Central Florida. I want to shift gears a little bit. Sure. I know that you're connected with UCF and, yes. and uh, as well as Space Florida. There seems to be some efforts to get universities more engaged in space. Uh, UCF has a new director for a space yeah, institute Ray Lugo. center there. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, Florida Tech has always been involved in some space Very research, so. but I know that there's a bill to try to create a new space center there. Why is that important? What does that add to the space well, picture here? I think it's very important because traditionally, having even before I went to work with UCF quite a number, number of years ago, we recognized that investing in research uh, is really where you generate the real innovation. We've always been in Florida at Kennedy Space Center as a launch site, we've always been at the tail end of the process. Mm -hmm. And California, Colorado, those places are where the real innovation and, and the small business spin-offs from the innovation occur. You don't really have a heck of a lot of that here in KSC like you do at uh, UC Boulder in, in Colorado, which traditionally, I think, has gotten more NASA research money than any other university. And we've been pushing to have Florida because I think we're usually annually in the bottom five of all the states on a per capita basis for getting NASA science money. And we would go to uh, Washington and say, hey, we need to change that. We're Florida. We deserve to be more than the bottom five. But then they would point to how much money of NASA's budget is coming to Florida because of the shuttle program. Right. And you know, the wind goes out of your sails on that. However, that ain't the case anymore. So we're now trying to, and it, it's a very critical mechanism for having the state move back up the food chain to the more value added capabilities of design and assembly and research associated with the development of this high tech technology. 
So that's really our goal, and we're, um, whether it's Florida Tech working at the state level or UCF's Florida Space Institute with Ray Lugo, as well as ongoing efforts with Embry-Riddle and University of Florida and others, uh, there is a conscious effort for Florida to catch up because we're behind. So somebody, you know, in, NASA needs to find a new coating or a new switch that works better in space under this right. circumstance for this mission. Some researcher or professor finds that through scientific research but keeps the technology and the know-how, delivers what they need to to NASA but finds a commercial application for it and that's where the jobs grow? Is that, am I, I mean, that's No, that, that, that's, that's very close. I mean, there are other elements of it. Just having the skill set and the talent pool where, whether it's NASA or Department of Energy or DOD or whomever, knows that there's a real uh, uh, intellectual, there's substantive intellectual capital in an area that they can make investments because those people are working in tangential industries uh, there's the academic capability to reinforce and sustain the, the kinds of, the neat thing like at, at, at UCF, one of the things that was a demonstration of the importance of it to the university is the university committed faculty lines. And that's really the currency of realm in an academic environment is the, the university agrees to pay what's necessary to attract good faculty. Because okay. at the end of the day, that kind of brilliance is what you're after as a university. And we need to, you know, put in place the landscape that allows us to effectively do that. And we're making progress. One of the other interesting issues that I know Space Florida is working on is winning designation as a, a place to do research and development on drones, mm -hmm. uh, unmanned aircraft. Um, those are always con controversial right now because people picture the Predator drones. Nobody right. wants... Hellfire missiles raining down on Sam's Club. Right. You know, uh, explain that effort. What, what what are we looking at here? Well, essentially, it's motivated by the fact that the Congress about two years ago tasked the FAA with developing the policies and the technology required to allow the introduction of the unmanned aerial systems into the general aviation airspace. Okay. Because that's all controlled as it should be, because you've got general aviation with people flying the little Piper Cubs, and then you have the big commercial aircraft, then you have Air Force and Navy fighters all transiting, and the, the FAA is responsible for managing all that airspace. And then you have restricted areas, uh, like in the eastern gulf uh, off the coast of um, the Panhandle at Eglin and Hurlburt, where they're doing testing of weapon systems. There's, there's big chunks of air where the general aviation public can't go. But then most of it is open to the general, general airspace. And what the FAA is responsible for doing is figuring out how do we allow this technology to be introduced safe to, safely and responsibly into the general aviation airspace because the introduction of this capability is huge uh, in terms of uh, the applications with which people will make money and knowledge will be added and business will be enlightened, academic research will be enhanced. It's like the internet. When you first established it, nobody really knew what it was going to be good for. Mm -hmm. But now, you know, there's a billion new applications a day, you know, and, you know, it's huge. The problem is you're introducing a high a technology with a lot of capability, not all of it good. And it do, you know, there's a lot of concern about, you know, well, is this going to allow the police to do surveillance, you know, Fourth Amendment concerns about unlawful search and seizure. And that's a very important issue. Somebody's got to care about that. I care about it. But that really is we're we're trying to create an environment where the technology and policies to allow this um, this, the introduction of this capability to flourish because the economic potential is huge. Uh, it's worth thousands and thousands of jobs in the state of Florida alone. But exactly how we monitor the privacy and guaranteeing civil liberties, you know, that's not an FAA job, certainly not a Space Florida job. That's a job of the people who are complaining, the legislature and the Congress. That's where, you know, that's their job is to figure out how to do that safely, but also not 
you know, there's despicable behavior on the internet every day. And it requires policymakers to monitor that, to stay on top of that, to do their jobs. But you don't shut it down. Right. You know, so we're, that's, that's effectively what we're trying to do, is create an environment where Florida can be really at the forefront of developing these new technologies, um, because they're gonna be great law enforcement, obviously, but you know, disaster relief, agriculture, you know, counting sea cows. Uh, How about flying a drone into a hurricane instead of putting oh, a bunch much. of guys on a plane oh, that's and exactly having them what fly they're doing. in? And they're already doing that. And the neat thing is you can fly it right at the surface of the water where the energy from the ocean is transiting into the, the storm itself and really start to better understand what the heck drives this thing. Uh, I mean, the opportunity is really where people are really going to make a lot of money and do really amazing things are, we don't even know, we can't conceive of what they're going to be yet. Uh, like I can see, my personal joke is, I can see it in the villages, the homeowners associations are going to be using them to do, de you know, making sure landscape ordinances are being properly <laughs> followed and now, things of that nature. wouldn't that be, you know, we've yeah, got to make sure we draw the line there. Probably would. We don't want them back here, look, you know, driving around looking for out of compliance septic tanks or fences or things Absolutely. in people's backyards. No, I, I mean, it, 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 is a, it is a challenge, and right. that challenge is going to have to be met. But the upside on it is so massive right. that we, it, we, we need to allow it. We just have to work hard and make sure it's done properly. Remember, you can comment on anything you see on this program or read in Florida Today by sending an email to letters at floridatoday.com. That's our program. We'll see you right here next week on WBCC and floridatoday.com. Thank you.